much. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you, folks. Um, it's it's uh, great to be here uh, as a fellow medical scientist. Uh, and to, I mean, how do you follow that? The performance, the polished performances of the speakers that have preceded me is really fantastic. Um, I can tell you, if somebody asked me when I just graduated, would I address a room full of my peers, I'd have run a mile. So, <laughs> well done. Um, it, they've kind of encapsulated the theme and the journey which I want to bring you on with my personal experience because uh, really what I want to be saying to you tonight is that through the career development pathways that are available for medical scientists, you're not just pigeonholed into, you know, contemporary or, or, or typical hospital work. You have industry, you have research. Yes, you have the, the hospital uh, options open to you as well, but the patient care piece is behind it all. And I know there's always a vocational element to why we do these things, uh, but the scientific training, the, the uh, education that you're getting now would stand you in really, really good stead. And so hopefully I want to show you that. I mean, some of the work is fantastic. Brian, uh, I, I am a graduate of the uh, uh, University of Ulster in Coleraine many, many moons ago. But um, I was actually fortunate to be supervised by Professor Brian Flatt, who uh, Brian is under. And back then, he was a really, really world-renowned expert in diabetes. So you, your, your career path is set. And we'll be keeping an eye on your, your development down through the years. So could I give a kind of applause, please? For <laughs> Now, Ireland is a small world, Ireland is a small country, and <laughs> I met uh, Debbie at Biomedica, and when was it, back in? Last year. It was it last year, yeah, 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 earlier on in the year, <laughs> <laughs> and, getting, and getting old. But um, uh, we, we discovered, obviously, we, we didn't discover, obviously, but we discovered in the course of a, of a, of a conversation one evening that we were from the, the same part of, the, of, of West Cork, and we also discovered that uh, Debbie's uncle was a teacher of mine, <laughs> and he was, uh, he was my football trainer. So, hence the invite, obviously. So, nepotism begins at home. But, um, so Debbie went to school in Bandon, as I did, many years ago. You went to school a lot later than I did. Um, but uh, I never got to tell her that night that um, I actually did go to the convent uh, every week. Uh, I did history. Uh, on my own, and I went to the convent. But, but the claim to fame is that um, me, two girls, and Graham Norton every Thursday were inside the convent gates in Bandon back in uh, <laughs> 1981. So he was Graham Walker back then. So uh, he's, uh, I don't know if that's got anything to do with his father Ted uh, piece and his, his penchant for dressing up as a priest. I'm not so sure. So, uh. so I'm the Managing Director of Biomedis Ireland, as, as uh, Mary has said, and we are, I'll just give you a potted overview of what we do. I mean, we're the largest independent provider of diagnostic pathology, so we would work with 98% of public hospital laboratories in the country. We would work with all the private hospitals. We uh, have uh, a health screening service, whereby we have nurses and doctors that uh, work in the corporate setting. So, for example, we've done um, big screens for the revenue commissioners, for example, where we screen three and a half thousand people a year. Um, we do uh, a lot of work in the Dublin site, in the Sandyford facility, and we have over 100 employees working there, and we have some contractors as well, across all disciplines except blood transfusion in, in, in general. But um, it's, a, it's a big operation, and um, we have a nationwide logistics service as well, which means we have 29 vans which work with hospitals like Mayo General, uh, University Hospital Galway. We collect samples under very, very stringent conditions for transportation and tracking, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, um, it's, it, it's an unusual business model because the majority of laboratory medicine is still delivered through the public sector. But there is a requirement through overflow services and specialized testing to outsource. And that's a model that is immature in Ireland, and it's immature in the UK, but the rest of the world, they deliver pathology and diagnostic pathology services in a, in a, in a partnership approach, shall we say. But since 2008, we've been part of the Biomnis Group, 
which is, uh, well, look, it's been in operation since 1897 in, in one shape or another. Uh, it was founded in 1897 by a guy, Marcel Meria, who um, was a predecessor or a protege of Louis Pasteur. And if anybody's heard of Biomeria and Sanofi Pasteur, our, our, our previous lab group name was Laboratoire, Mar Laboratoire Marcel Meria. And they were a foundation that split into a pharmaceutical company, a diagnostic manufacturing company, and a diagnostic services provider company. So we are, they have over 100 years of experience delivering really, really cutting edge molecular biology products, infectious disease products, um, two and a half thousand different tests. They have the biggest menu of tests in Western Europe, and we are part of that group. So that's really our, our key, um, our unique selling feature really in Ireland is that you cannot do all the tests, no matter how big a hospital lab you are. These guys churn through 40,000 patient tests a day, and these are very, very, very specialized. And they have two sites, one in Paris and one in Lyon. And if I tell you that any time we have ever brought uh, pathology professors or, or, or laboratory medicine directors from some of the bigger hospitals over, their jaws just drop, the scale. And we're not just talking about sort of scale as in a factory operation. They have so many pathologists. And over there, pathologists are employees. So they will do and authorize every single result that, that passes through. So it's a very, very impressive model. They would have a different, um, a different sort of staffing ratio, if you like. They would have scientists more up the value chain in terms of interpretation and uh, consultation with the pathologists. And for uh, routine uh, instrument, you know, particularly in the automated sections, routine uh, setup for QA and calibration, they would have people with two and three year diplomas, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that is something that is typical, again, of nearly every country uh, that uh, provides such services in an outsourced way, uh, UK and Ireland is, 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 is quite atypical, you know. Um, so a decent sized company, about a quarter of a billion in, in, in revenue every year. And over the last three to four years, we have been working with them to develop the Dublin site and to develop uh, new competencies, technology transfer, etc. So we are always looking, we're always looking for really good biomedical scientists with, uh, with, um, with, with, with really good skill sets. Um, just going to ask a, a question. How many, just a show of hands, how many would like to work in a, in a hospital setting that, that right now you, you intend to work in direct patient care? Would that be the... Yeah. Mm. So again, you know, if I'd, if, I'd, if I'd asked that question 10 years ago of a similar audience, all the hands, all the hands would have gone up. So listening to the, to the graduates, and hopefully what you get from me is that your degree, your qualification in medical science will, will open up a huge vista, and not just in Ireland, but, but global warming is man-made. Uh, on another show of hands, how many people believe that that is the fact that man has created the highest increase in global temperatures on average in 800,000 years. You see, I would say nearly everybody. Yeah. See, if, if, I, if I was standing before the best and brightest, maybe legal people, business people, captains of industry, I wouldn't get anything like that. And that's, that's where you're different. It's just scientific. You have scientific minds, and you've got rational minds, and you want proof and you're inquiring, and you ask all the questions. And my central thesis is that basis, that education now, because science is for young minds, your education now will set you up better for any other careers subsequently, and will enable you to change into different parallel universes career-wise than the other way around. You, don't, you rarely see somebody who has studied law for 20 years going, I think I'm going to be a biomedical scientist. You know, they might do medicine or they might, you know, they might do engineering, but it rarely happens because it probably is very, very difficult. So I think you've got really huge potential. So I was asked what my educational journey was and I said I'd share it with you. It's kind of like this is your life for me because <laughs> it started a long time ago. But if, I, if there's anything to take from this, 
Well, okay. I like to go to college. <laughs> so uh, there's obviously a slight masochistic uh, tendency somewhere. But my core really, I mean, my, my, my core years were between 1985 and 1992. And I would have done um, biomedical sciences, medical laboratory sciences, as it was then, back the old route. So it would have been a three-year certificate, multidisciplinary, two years academic in the CIT, as it was the Regional Technical College, and then one year hospital placement. And then you choose your specialised subject, so a two-year diploma. And mine was uh, clinical biochemistry. So for somebody with attention deficit disorder like myself, it was useful because you could, you could do something and complete it within three years. You could travel to England or wherever and work as a locum or work in, excuse me, in agency work, come back, think about what you wanted to specialise in, specialise in it, two-year diploma. Um, and then you had the option then to move up, move up a year with the fellowship, which at that stage it was the fellowship of the Institute of Biomedical Sciences which is now equivalent to the, you know, the Fellowship of the Academy of Medical the, the FAMNS. Um, and that was in the DIT. So um, at the time, again, the, the fledgling masters in biomedical sciences in University of Ulster was being offered. And like um, one of the speakers, I decided to do it full time and get the full benefit of uh, going on tour up in Northern Ireland, etc. cetera. Um, and in total, that's really where I consider, if I, you know, if I ever describe myself, everything else is, is on top of that, but I am a clinical biochemist originally by training, by thinking, and um, everything else was a sort of a bonus or happenstance as I changed career. And I, I, there, there is a logical progression through a lot of these that, I'll, that, I'll, that I'll, I'll run through you to show you that you're not straight-jacketed into, okay, I'm working in a hospital now, I'm going to be working there until I retire. You have really, really huge opportunities. And I'm what's described as a baby boomer. So, you know, I was before 1963 or on the cusp of, then you have Generation X, then you have Generation Y. So you have people have different expectations in life. People, you as graduates and, and potential graduates, you may not look at a career for 20 years or 30 years. And you have those opportunities globally to say, actually, in five years, I'm going to do something else. And in five years, or, or three years, or whatever it is. But that's, that's the way things have changed. The global workplace has changed. Your training, again, your scientific training, your biomedical science training will give you a lot of advantages. <clears throat> so yes, so basically, I did science, I did law, and then I, I did the obligatory business things that I would have to do to be conversant with the jargon of growth, and uh, you know all the all the the MBA sort of jargon. Even though I didn't go for an MBA, I mean somebody said to me, I was asking about maybe should I do an MBA, and he said, well, how do you know somebody's got an MBA? And I said, I don't know. And he says, they tell you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't put it better than Leonardo da Vinci in terms of science and develop to develop a complete mind. And if you take anything from this which I have done over the last 30 years, you should realize that everything connects to everything else. And I'm not talking about karma or fate. Everybody has their own internal purpose and their, their own internal drive. And um, the learning never stops, or, or, or it shouldn't stop. And now more than ever, you have the opportunities for continuous learning, continuous education, and to keep going. And uh, I think it's a really, really important thing that um, you listen to your internal self. Sometimes. Your BFF isn't the best advisor. If you want to drive and get on, you think about what you really, really want to do. And you, you're in a good op opportunity in your undergraduate years to think through that. And four years seems like, seems like a long time. 17 and 18 years of age, 19 years of age, two years to get to halfway through can seem a long time. But you should stick at it. It's just it's really worth it. So again, <clears throat> career a bit like snake, snakes and ladders, but the, 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 the progression for me was logical, even if it was post hoc, in the sense that um, I worked as a, back then, you know, the early 80s, the economy wasn't fantastic, so I worked as a, a locum biomedical scientist in the UK and Ireland in, in, in a number of locations. Um, I decided as a left-hander, I kept knocking test tubes, because we still worked with test tubes back then. Everybody else, the right-handers, would put them to my, so I 
So I said, okay, I think I'll make a move from the lab into business. <laughs> Just might save a life. Um, <laughs> but then I got, I did that for a number of years. Um, I got some really good training and got a glimpse of how business works, but it was still technical. It was still technical work. Uh, immunology platforms um, representing Roche and, and Bayer and, and, the, and those companies and getting international exposure because they would bring you on three to four week training courses. I mean, they really, I'll give you an example. Um, there was um, an immunoassay analyzer. I mean, any clinical biochemist who are actually working now would know that there's a, there's a, a Centaur and, and Bayer with the company that made it. And they would insist on any distributors to travel to the UK for three and a half weeks, they'd fly you back at the weekend, but you'd be paired with an engineer. So in effect, you're working with an engineer to strip it down to see how it works. You know, even, even, even from a sales perspective or from a technical perspective, it was fantastic because you know, troubleshooting for clients, et cetera, et cetera, uh, made a lot of sense. Um, I moved subsequently, I got a, a, an offer for, to head a sort of a, a, a twin clinical chemistry stroke toxicology lab in the forerunner of Biomnist in Dublin, which was claiming the bar trees. And they, we, we, we became the, the biggest provider of drug testing for um, substance abuse clinics, for the Irish Prison Service, and for the workplace. So again, it's one of these things, not a lot of people know that, but people who work in global multinationals might know that there are drug testing regimes at pre-employment <coughs> level. Um, so there's a, there's a strong technical piece because they want to use point of care kits. Then there's the screening kits, screening test in the lab. And then there's the confirmatory tests, so the really hard stuff, gas chromatography, mass spec. But there's also a huge medical legal piece, the rights, you're invading bodily privacy, potentially, consent, um, um, industrial relations within a company, union workforce, terms and conditions, of employment contracts, etc., etc., etc. So over the years, and it was five years in total, I got a, I developed a sort of an interest as the lead within the group for um, the forensic talks, medical legal side of things. So at night, I just went back and did a initially did a diploma in legal services um, uh, in legal studies, shall I say, uh, over two years, and took a year off, and then went back. And at that stage, you know, you just do your lectures at night in the King's Inns and just study to be a. <laughs> A, a barrister with no real, no real uh, um, yearning to become a barrister, if you know what I mean, and, and, and down the week and go down to the courts and stuff. But what it meant was, it's like the social proof and, and, and uh, it's, it's like, um, if you ever heard of Cialdini, if you don't, think, look him up, Robert, Robert Cialdini, um, Influence is a book he wrote. But authority is one of the things and in business, if you have authority, or in, in, any, in any line of, uh, of work, if you have authority, you're more believable, obviously. Um, you're an expert, and um, that was a successful move from our point, point of view because we uh, developed a very, strong, um, a very strong offering in drugs of abuse. And we were the go-to company for transportation companies, shipping companies, um, airline companies, um, pharmaceutical companies. We, we had a we had a monopoly almost, which was good in one way. Um, but then, different changes within the organization, and I moved into client services, director of sales and marketing, director of business development. Um, I took two years out to work in the RCSI to work with campus companies. Uh, in One of them was a biomedical science fledgling company, another one was clinical trials. Um, and then there was um, a change at group level, and there was a requirement for a, a Managing director, but and, and, and it seems like a game of snakes and ladders into the lab, out of the lab, etc., etc. But the thing is, at every stage, my scientific training and education was used, and in the industry, I, I, there has never been a time when I have not had to look at something from a, a proposal for new instrumentation, a proposal for new tests, um, work with. Our R&D committee in, in Leon, which is where our headquarters is, and I'll show you the building in a while, uh, collaboration around new novel markers, working with the public sector, working with uh, key opinion leaders, etc. So the other stuff, while it's more than incidental, again, I need to talk to business, etc., etc., 
the legal background came in handy from a contractual point of view, employment law point of view when I reached this stage. But it's really, really, there are so many conversations I would have had to defer to if I didn't have the scientific training and background. It, it, it always stands to you. So the current role is not exactly like that. My wife says it's a good likeness. I'm just, you know. She's cruel. She's from Kerry. I'm from Cork. It's a mixed marriage. So what would I say? The link, the medical sciences qualification, I think I've said a lot of it before. I think the guys have proven it already in their presentations. I think scientific reasoning and discipline is extremely useful in the fuzzy world of business. You know, rational thinking. It's a good BS detector. I've said this before, science is for young brains, and it's certainly easier to do it this way. And if you want to develop your careers into parallel universe pathways down the line, if you get into industry, you will be seen if you're a, if you're a good performer, whether you're working in the lab, in QA, compliance, etc. within a hospital. Um, a good friend of mine, and a number of friends of mine that have come through uh, the lab side of things are now at top management level in the in hospitals in uh, Kerry, Kerry General, in NACE. People do see standout performers, and I think the scientific background is being seen now as a really strong help. I have said this before already, the sound basis of all the disciplines has given me an advantage, and so there are, there, are, there are touch points I would have. I would have conference calls with some of the leaders uh, in France of their sections about developments in Ireland I don't have to defer those conversations to somebody else and get a second-hand version of events. This is the, this is, this is the, 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 the nub of it. I mean, people who are uh, uh, familiar with Mean Six Sigma and Deming's quality principles, etc. the ability to keep asking why, why, why. It's not just in the lab. It's in business. It's in the world. Your, your curious mind. Maintain the curiosity. It's really important. So for people who might be wondering, OK, because there are boom and bust cycles, as we've seen, and what's the job prospects like, et cetera, et cetera, I'd like to just give you some kind of headline core uh, points around global diagnostics and di the diagnostic industry in general. And one of them is that more than 70% of diagnostic decisions, clinical decisions, are based on a lab test. Some people have put it as high as 80%. So again, intuitively, if you ask between diagnostic imaging and, diagnostic, you know, and, and lab testing, would it be 50-50? It's not. The reliance on lab testing is incredible. It's incredible. And it behoves. We, we have a very, very strong reputation globally in, in the training of our biomedical science graduates. And I've been to the States. I've been to, obviously, I've been to France. We're much, you know, like for like, we have much higher training. The challenge now is for the public sector, for example, if you are looking to work in hospitals, is not to get, because technology happens so quickly, is not to get, you know, have a master's and be stuck in a spinning bench for, for a six month rota. That's no good to anybody. So there are, they are looking at the reconfiguration of laboratory medicine and services and maybe bringing, you know, the clinical scientist route and bringing people up the value chain to free the consultants for some of the other stuff that they need to do. Any, any, any patient record, <coughs> lab test results, lab test results, lab test results. There's, there may be too many of them, but they need them. And doctors are practicing very defensive medicine nowadays for medical legal reasons, so they will try and get, and we all know that the, the, the cases in the UK and Ireland and elsewhere, they are trying to cover themselves, obviously, and one way of doing that is making sure they have all the lab tests, and they have them again, and they have them again. The aging population, as we'll see in the point uh, a little bit later, the aging population and the decrease in mortality, so people living between 65 and 85 and 90, is creating huge uh, challenges because it has a huge impact on the delivery of diagnostic pathology in the public sector. So the numbers are going this way. Um, I'm not so sure. I mean, we think you've, this is probably, is this, would this be the biggest? It's the biggest intake of uh, medical science uh, 
undergraduates for a while here, or is... Yeah, we're capped. Now. You're capped, yeah, yeah okay. So yeah. It's, it's yeah, so, so, uh, there is, so back, back to my, my original point about where the jobs will be, there will be plenty of jobs, there has to be. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, in the United States, um, there are less and less people going into medical science, so there's huge <coughs> opportunities in the United States. The state of Arizona has no training scheme for medical scientists. Which is, which is very, very strange indeed, given the, the top point there. So it's something to bear in mind as you're working through your, your, your career choices. The whole revolution, molecular biology, companion diagnostics, personalized medicine, that's going to change a huge amount of how we deliver uh, diagnostic pathology, but it's going to make it really, really interesting. Really interesting. Um, do you offer cervical cytology and, um, and um, cytopathology as, a, as an option? And is there anybody, show of hands again, is there anybody looking to do cytology as a, as a, as a career? You're, you're, you're looking to do it, and no. Has the, are people, people have been following the change in the way yeah, yeah, it's been yeah. delivered, and, and, and perhaps they're aware of what's happening down the line with molecular biology and HPV gene testing, and. So, for, for example, for, for anybody who isn't, the, like the Welsh uh, national program is changing uh, to uh, primarily a front-end a front HPV gene test with sort of reflex cervical cytology. And with automated imaging, that's going to really make that skill set redundant in, in, in reality. And by 2016, the NCSS is probably going to do something very, very similar. So what you're going to see is... Um, because I think maybe everybody may be aware that they outsourced the national screening program to the United States. They brought 30,000, 35,000 smears back into the public sector. Um, but from 2016 onwards, there may be 60 to 80,000 smears a year required in, in, um, in Ireland, which isn't really enough from a business perspective to, to keep a full training program going through. So I would keep an eye on things there. This is important because Ireland has taken a strong lead in, uh, you know, accreditation to uh, 15189 or to ISO accreditation. And in fact, believe it or not, we're, we're way ahead of Germany, we're way ahead of France, and we're way ahead of the UK, and we're miles ahead of the US, and people don't realise that. But something to bear in mind is with your training, uh, keep, keep a strong, get strong competencies in 15189 because it is going global. <laughs> So every, every lab in the, U, in the UK has to move from its original peer-reviewed CPA to, to 15189. The same in France is a mandatory change by 2017 that 50% of labs have to change to, to offer, and that's a legal requirement. So I think it was mentioned earlier on quality and regulatory uh, affairs. That's a, that's a niche area as well. And in fact, as we spoke a little bit earlier in the canteen, there are opportunities if people are so inclined the people who pick the legs off uh, ants, if they, for, for auditors, because from a European perspective, they cannot get enough auditors. And my organization was the first lab, public or private in Ireland, to get uh, an ISO accreditation mark. And we've been accredited continuously for 15 years. Um, believe me, it takes a long time to get them to come around and audit your organization. So there are opportunities if anybody is of a, is of a, a mind. If anybody wants any information, on any of that, they can uh, look up our website, but they'll be free to contact me as well. I'll leave contact details. Um, but this, is a, this was a, an, an estimate um, done a number of years ago, and it's saying that by 2017, this was done in 2011. So in a six-year period, they're saying that uh, pathology testing would increase by 90% in the United States. There's many reasons, as I've laid out before that, but um, that doesn't look like, that with the, you know, the increase in chronic disease, obesity, Diabetes, it's going to be really, really vital. And I've mentioned this about the aging populations and the reliance on that, on that diagnostics. So labs are vital, and laboratory medicine is vital, and laboratory medicine graduates, biomedical scientists, medical scientists are vital. So whenever you look and say, where will I work, what will I do, there is a huge spectrum of opportunities out there. Um, this is our HQ in Leon, and 
just looked at, uh, we, we, you know, recently with the Ebola scare, um, I've been following the, um, I, I would get the communications, internal communications at a high level in, from, from France to the different things. So the lab there on stilts has smallpox, Ebola. It has anything you can mention, again, for people who are really interested in virology. Um, that's one of the, I think there's only five P4 labs in the, in, in the world. And um, the health and safety communiques since the Ebola virus are flying around because they are handling samples, not kind of, we don't think, we're not sure. These are Ebola samples. So what they do is, again, over 100 years of expertise in, in infectious virology, uh, infectious microbiology. So it's a, it's a huge operation. I took this quite literally, actually. When, uh, <laughs> when David said advice to a student self, it was, I was thinking me, right? So, so back in the 80s, <laughs> that's not me, but I, you, know, you can't tell. Back in the 80s, Hairstyles like this, I mean, I, who's an Austin Powers fan, but bad hairstyles and flock of seagulls was all the rage. That was it, you know, so I kind of say, <laughs> if I was doing it again, no, no, no. I, won't, I don't have any of my own pictures, but uh, believe me, uh, you don't want to see them. <laughs> no. The 80s, the 90s, the noughties, and the, the, the 10s, things haven't really changed, I guess, in Irish student life. We do drink, and Irish students probably drink a little bit more than maybe their European counterparts. So my advice was going to be that, and maybe given the importance of the brain for scientific <laughs> endeavours, I thought, yeah, no, I'll come back at it. <laughs> I'll step back, let's be, let's be kind of realistic, let's be realistic. But, but for you guys, if there's, I, I, again, I can't say anything better than somebody like Martin Luther King. Um, this is really all about perseverance. Like you persevere. You have four years, you have five years, you have six years, you have seven years. Believe me, I started in 85. That has gone so fast. And it looks like a lot of hard work, and it was a lot of hard work, but it didn't seem like it, didn't seem like it at the time. And I didn't set out in 1985 to stand here as a, as a managing director. You know, there's people work in two year, three year, four year cycles, five years. So much more now. You have a lot of opportunities. You have a lot of choices as well. And decision making, again, listen to your inner self. You know, what do you really, you know, assess what your true talents are. Maybe even think about what you're better at than anybody else. For some of you, the science, when you graduate, you might not like it. It's a bit like um, uh, my wife's uh, solicitor, and she calls it the Ali McBeal syndrome. And she went back later on in life again. To, to study, but she met so many young people who said, well, I did it because I want to be like Ali McBeal. And they get into the really drudging, tortuous, turgid work of legal documents and conveyancing, and they go, I'm out of here. So you, you, you're in a good opportunity. You have a good opportunity now to assess your, um, your next three to four years beyond just your graduation. And what I'd like to do is give you that glimpse to say there's a huge amount of opportunities. This is, I know I have to do a tourist piece for Dingle County Kerry. <laughs> this is a couple of years ago. Um, my son didn't know I was behind him or beside him. And um, again, it's, it's like, at, at his age, it just seems to me like he's going, wow, look at that. Like, that's, that's all ahead of me. Now, unfortunately, he doesn't want to go near science. <laughs> it's a tortured soul he wants to write. But anyway, there we go. We can't, we can't, we can't everything, can we? So, that's it, folks. <laughs>